Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 8. In this lecture, we'll discuss waves. This topic is covered in Chapter 16 of our textbook by Sorway and Jouett. In this and the next few lectures, we want to discuss waves. To understand waves, one must first understand simple harmonic motion. A primary example of simple harmonic motion has been the mass spring system. It turns out many types of waves, like water waves or waves along a rope, can be modeled as a collection of vertical mass spring systems oscillating together in a coordinated fashion. For that reason, we begin with a review of the mass spring system. Recall that the position of a vertical mass spring system can be represented by this function here. Y represents the vertical coordinate of the mass. T is the independent variable in this context. It represents time. A is referred to as the amplitude of the oscillations. It represents the maximum distance or displacement of the mass relative to its equilibrium position. Omega is referred to as the angular frequency of the oscillations. It represents the number of radians that the mass can oscillate through in each second. Phi is referred to as the phase constant, and it indicates the starting point of the mass. So phi would be a different number when the mass starts above the equilibrium or starts below the equilibrium at t equals 0. Here we're representing the oscillations using a sine function. One can also use a cosine function. We refer to both of those functions as sinusoidal functions. The numerical value of phi would be different depending on whether one uses a sine or a cosine function. That difference is usually plus or minus pi over 2 radians. There are a few other facts that we need to review about the mass spring system. Recall that the angular frequency depends on the mass and the spring constant of the system. We can express omega as the square root of k over m. Here we are assuming that we're talking about a simple mass spring system without any damping or a driving force. In the context of oscillations, we also often talk about the period of the oscillations. The period of the oscillation refers to the number of seconds that are required for one complete cycle or one complete oscillation. Given k and m, one calculates omega, and given omega, one can then calculate the period as 2 pi over omega. One often also talks about the frequency of the oscillations, denoted by the letter f. Frequency is omega over 2 pi. As you can see, frequency can also be expressed as 1 over the period. The frequency tells us how many cycles the mass spring system can go through in each unit of time, in each second. We're also sometimes interested in the speed of those oscillations, the speed with which the mass is moving. In that case, the velocity would be the derivative of position with respect to time. If we're representing position using the function sine, then velocity would end up being a cosine function. You can also take the second derivative of the position to find the acceleration of the mass. Notice that position, velocity, and acceleration all depend on time through sinusoidal functions. We begin now with a very general definition of waves. A wave is a collective oscillation in any medium which results in the propagation of energy. Notice that this general definition has two parts to it. In order to have a wave, one needs oscillations, so we need periodic repetitive motion of something, of some atoms or some molecules in general of some medium, and we also need propagation. Propagation in this context refers to the spreading motion or the transmission of energy. So in order to have a wave, we need to have oscillations, but those oscillations need to result in the traveling or spreading or transmission of some type of energy. 
There are many different examples of waves. One may speak of water waves. In that case, the oscillations are in water. It's water molecules that are actually oscillating, so we would say the medium is water. One may speak of sound waves. In that case, the medium is air, so it's air molecules, more precisely nitrogen and oxygen molecules that are oscillating and transmitting energy. One can even talk about seismic waves. These are the waves that one gets following an earthquake. In that case, it's the dirt or the rocks of the ground that are oscillating. Our long-term goal is to develop a mathematical framework that can be used to describe all kinds of waves. There are many different types of waves. However, for us in this class, our primary example or prototype of waves will be rope waves. Rope waves are relatively easy to understand and easy to imagine. In fact, most people can even experiment with rope waves at home if they wanted to. So for this lecture and the next couple of lectures, we're going to concentrate on rope waves. Once we have thoroughly understood the basic properties of rope waves, we'll move on to more advanced waves. This simulation here will help us understand the basic properties of waves. What we have here is a stretch of rope or string. These circles or beads that you see are supposed to represent the molecules or atoms of the rope. On the left end, the rope is attached to a wrench, which I can move up and down. On the right end, the rope just extends out the window. For the time being, we're not too interested in what's happening on the right end of the rope. We will only assume that someone is holding the right end, or maybe the right end of the rope is tied to a tree, for example. The only thing that's necessary is that the rope be pulled taut. In other words, there needs to be tension in the rope for us to generate waves along the rope. Other than that, for now, we're not too interested in what's happening on the right end of the rope. To generate waves along this rope, I can just grab the left end and move it up and down. And as I do that, I generate waves. As you can see, these waves are propagating or traveling from left to right and out the window. Now, obviously, I'm not doing a very good job because it's a little difficult to move the wrench up and down in a regular fashion. To generate more regular waves, what I need is a machine. So what we have here now is a machine that can generate waves for us. The machine is a relatively simple one. It consists of a rod that is attached to a wheel that can rotate. You can imagine the wheel is attached to an electric motor that can rotate the wheel with constant angular speed. As the wheel rotates, we would say that a point on the wheel executes uniform circular motion around the center of the wheel. The rod is attached to the wheel, so as the wheel rotates, the rod will move up and down. We would say that as this point executes uniform circular motion, the rod executes simple harmonic motion as it moves up and down. As it does so, it moves the left end of the rope and it generates nice regular waves for us. Our goal ultimately is to develop a mathematical expression that describes this wave. More specifically, we would like to know the displacement of each molecule at any given time. For example, if I were to pause this simulation at a particular instant in time, you would see that some of the molecules are displaced above the equilibrium line, while some of the molecules are displaced below the equilibrium line. The equilibrium line is this dashed line that you see here. We would like to know the exact displacement of each one of these molecules. This molecule here is also displaced below the equilibrium line, but its displacement is less than the displacement of this molecule. So each molecule has a vertical displacement, some motion in the y direction, and we would like to have a formula that can help us calculate the y coordinate of each molecule. A little more precisely, if I gave you the x coordinate of a particular molecule along the length of the rope, you should be able to take that x coordinate, put it into your formula, and give me the vertical displacement of that particular molecule. Of course, your formula would also have to depend on time. 
because each one of these molecules is moving up and down. If I paused the simulation at a different moment in time, you would see that the same molecule that used to be above the equilibrium line is now below the equilibrium line. So ultimately, we would like to have a formula that depends on x and t. If I give you the x coordinate of this particular molecule and ask you for its displacement at, let's say, 17 seconds, you should be able to take x and t, plug it into your formula, and tell me exactly what the vertical displacement or the y coordinate of this molecule is. To help us develop that precise mathematical expression for the rope wave, we need one very important fact. That fact is that the motion of each one of these individual molecules is relatively simple. In fact, each individual molecule is executing simple harmonic motion. This fact may not be obvious as you look at the wave in real time, but if we slow down the simulation, you can see it a little bit better. Looking at the simulation now, you should notice that although the wave is moving from left to right, although something, perhaps energy, is propagating or traveling from left to right, the individual molecules themselves only move up and down. So although the molecules are being displaced, they're being displaced only in the vertical direction or along the y-axis and not at all in the horizontal direction. You can see this fact a little bit better if I lay down some rulers. For example, track the motion of this third green atom from the left. As the wave propagates from left to right, notice that the green atom only moves up and down strictly along the edge of this ruler. So while its y coordinate is changing as a function of time, its x coordinate is not changing. That tells us that although the wave is moving out the window, the molecules themselves never really move very far from their original locations. In fact, this motion is simple harmonic motion. It resembles the motion of a mass spring system. If we were to take a vertical spring and hang it from the ceiling and attach a mass to it and then observe the oscillations of that vertical mass spring system, we would see that that mass moves up and down in exactly the same way that this particular atom is moving up and down. In fact, every atom along the rope is doing exactly the same thing. Every one of them is executing simple harmonic motion just at slightly different times. This fact is important because it tells us that we may develop our mathematical expression for waves based on the same mathematical foundation that we used to describe the mass spring system. So how do we precisely or mathematically describe waves? What are the important characteristics or parameters that must be specified to describe a rope wave, for example? Well, we've already mentioned that the motion of each wave element, that is each atom or molecule of the rope, can be described as a simple harmonic motion. What that means is that at the very least, we will need these three parameters. A is amplitude, omega is angular frequency, and phi is the phase constant. If each atom is undergoing simple harmonic motion, at the very least, we need to specify these three parameters to fully describe the wave motion. We should also recognize that waves essentially look like sine or cosine functions. Waves move or oscillate in the same way that sine or cosine functions move or oscillate, and therefore we'll be using sinusoidal functions to describe waves. If we're talking about the vertical motion of rope molecules, for example, we will use the letter y to denote their vertical coordinate. And that coordinate will depend on two variables, x and t. x tells us where we are along the length of the rope, so which atom or molecule of the rope we're talking about. And t, of course, is time. That function is going to be equal to some amplitude 
times a sinusoidal function. Sometimes we'll use a sine, sometimes we'll use a cosine. And at the very least, that sinusoidal function must depend on omega and phi. But of course, there will be other parameters. After all, a wave is more complicated than just the simple harmonic motion of a single mass spring system. So we also need to discuss other parameters that are important to wave motion. A quantity that is extremely important to wave motion is wave speed. After all, we have described waves as the propagation or the traveling or the spreading of energy. This is something that we didn't really discuss when we were talking about the mass spring system because the mass spring system simply oscillated in place. But with waves, energy travels along the length of the rope. And if the rope is long, then that energy can travel very long distances. And so one of the things that we're interested in is in knowing how fast that energy travels. This is referred to as wave speed. Note that wave speed is different from the element speed. Individual elements of the wave, that is the atoms or molecules, might be oscillating up and down with some velocity, but as they do that, the energy is going to be propagating or moving horizontally along the length of the rope. Those two speeds are important, and therefore, when we finally develop our mathematical description of waves, we hope to see V somewhere in that description. As it turns out, V depends on properties of the rope, like the mass or mass density of the rope, and also the tension in the rope. So we will have to develop equations that tell us exactly what V is for different types of ropes. Another important parameter in describing waves is the wavelength. Wavelength is denoted using the Greek letter lambda. Wavelength is essentially the peak to peak distance of the wave. So if you uh, take a picture of a wave, a snapshot at a single moment in time, and you look at two consecutive peaks, the distance between them, measured in meters, would be the wavelength of the wave. This is also a parameter that we did not discuss when we were talking about the mass spring system, because the mass spring system was just simply a single mass oscillating in place, but with a rope wave, we have many masses, many atoms or molecules, each one oscillating at the same time. So if we look at two atoms that are doing exactly the same thing, the distance between those two atoms would be referred to as the wavelength. Here I'm talking about the wavelength as the peak to peak distance. One can also talk about the valley to valley distance, and it would be exactly the same distance. In fact, you can also go from equilibrium to equilibrium. However, if you're going to choose equilibrium as your reference point, then you should be a little careful. The wavelength, for example, is the distance from this atom to this atom here, not the distance from this atom to this atom. Although this atom and this atom are both at equilibrium, one of them is going up while the other one is going down. So if you're going to measure the wavelength, lambda, you need to choose two points along the wave that have the same displacement and are moving in the same direction with the same speed. Probably the easiest way to do that is to simply look at two consecutive peaks, but you can also choose other points along the length of the rope. So ultimately, when we develop our mathematical expression for a wave, we hope to see lambda somewhere in that mathematical definition. We turn to developing that mathematical definition in our next lecture. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.